previously on Season 5 of the British Broadcasting Century Podcast. Before our recent specials, our moment-by-moment origin story of early British broadcasting reached the end of April 1923. I know, 80 episodes to reach five months into the BBC's life. At this point, there's been the launch of the Sykes Inquiry by the government, an anti-BBC press campaign in the Daily Express, Shakespeare's birthday broadcasts, a gala comedy concert sponsored by Harrods, and the BBC's one-room office at Magnet House, its temporary accommodation, has moved down the road to Savoy Hill on the north bank of the Thames where studios are being prepared as they pack up Marconi House. Yes, well, that move from Marconi House to Savoy Hill is what demarcates the start of Season 6. Join us next time for a very special episode that launches Savoy Hill, May the 1st, 1923. We'll actually reenact parts of the legendary launch night. It's one not to miss. But this episode, we'll see the Beeb off the premises of Marconi House, there on the Strand. But really... I want to look back to the very first day of the BBC at Marconi House, the 14th of November, 1922. Now, we recreated the first broadcast of the BBC many episodes ago now. You can find that in our back catalogue. But new information has come to light. Well, new old information. I found a reminiscence in the BBC Written Archive Centre, written by the first voice of the BBC, Arthur Burroughs. And he wrote, 20 years later, his memories of what it was like broadcasting for the first time on the BBC in Marconi House. A pea soup fog was hanging thickly over London 20 years ago last evening. So this episode, I'm going to read it to you in its entirety, and we're going to analyse it with special guests to ask, can we believe what Arthur Burroughs remembers of that first BBC broadcast. To hello, Marconi House, London, calling. Also on this podcast, we're not just reflecting on the BBC leaving Marconi House in 1923, but bang up to date. As I record this, the BBC has just left Wogan House here in 2024. I worked there on and off over the past 10 years or so across various Radio 2 shows. So I'll be reflecting on some memories of that later this podcast. And also, of course, it's after the sad death of Steve Wright. More thoughts on Steve and Wogan House coming up later this episode. From Marconi House to Wogan House, this, not made by the BBC, I hasten to add, is the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello, Paul Carenza here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for sticking with us here on the moment-by-moment origin story of Auntie Beep. Season 6A, they said it would never last. Then again, they said that about the BBC to begin with. It'll never replace the electrophone, they said. Yes, more on the electrophone in a few episodes' time. As for the Beeb, though, there it was on the last day of April 1923, ready to move from its first temporary studio at Marconi House into its first permanent home of Savoy Hill, literally just down the road. I mean, they could walk the stuff over, and they probably did. Many of the items were carried, many of the staff just walked or were carried. They had to be carried after Savoy Hill's launch night. That was a little boozy, as we'll find out next time. Now, if you're a supporter of this podcast on patreon.com slash Paul Carenza, then you can see we posted there previously a couple of videos of me walking and talking outside Savoy Hill, little tour around that vicinity, um, and near Marconi House as well. We did a walking tour from Magnet House, the BBC's first office, to Marconi House, its first studio, which is where Arthur Burroughs and Cecil Lewis, the programme directors of the BBC, would run from their head office day job to broadcasting for the children's hour and introducing concerts by evening from Marconi House. Well, that is over, and I hope you heard it clearly and enjoyed it as much as we did in the studio. Stand by for a few moments, please while the orchestra gets ready. And speaking of walking tours, I'm actually going to do one soon, open to other people. We don't quite know what date yet, on a Saturday probably, Saturday afternoon. Uh, We'll gather around about Savoy Hill, we'll have a little walk around Marconi House, Savoy Hill, end up with a drink at the Savoy Tap, nice little pub there. So if you'd like to join me on a walking tour, um, keep in touch. Uh, You can drop me an email, paul at paulcarenza.com, and I'll add you to a little list where I can send information of that um, when we do it. At some point, early 2024, on London's North Bank, if it's called that, it's not. Our occasional broadcasts from Marconi House had only an initial range of about 30 to 40 miles. That was Arthur Burroughs, and this is Harold Bishop. All the London programmes came from one very small studio, something like 23 feet by 18, at the top of Marconi House in the Strand. 
It was heavily draped with curtains to suppress echo. Here's another thing I've posted online. My son, big fan of Minecraft, he wanted something to do, so he decided to use his video game to design a building. And I had the plans here in one of these old books of Marconi House. So I said, why don't you put it to use and actually design for us in your Minecraft video game a blocky version of the Marconi House studio. Now, um, he was 11 years old when he did this, and uh, I'll put it on YouTube or Facebook group or something like that. Uh, link in the show notes to that if you would like to see a rough and ready Minecraft version of the first BBC Studios of Marconi House. I'm sure a slightly more accurate version could be done if anyone with 3D design skills wants to put that one together. A dingy room, 20 feet square, with a faded green carpet, a grand piano, a worn-out settee with the horsehair coming through. A microphone of the type commonly used in public telephone boxes was suspended in front of each performer. When you walked in, it felt like a padded cell. And morning, noon and night, it was crowded with people, among them Rex Palmer, who was the announcer. I can still see that dingy room with an old horsehair settee, rather the worse for wear, and a few kitchen-type chairs. But we had a piano and a pianola. It played from perforated music rolls, which were liable to go berserk and unravel themselves all over the studio floor. The voices there of the uncles, the pioneers who began London 200. And we'll hear at the end of this episode a little medley of some of the other voices and sounds you would have heard from Marconi House in those very earliest days of the BBC. But for now, let's go right back to day one. Arthur Burroughs, first voice of the BBC, wrote this memory, this reminiscence, this memoir. We don't quite know what it was for exactly, but I found it at the BBC Written Archive Centre, uh, having seen it referenced in a couple of academic theses, and I just wondered what was in this unpublished memoir written by this radio prophet. Well, I went and had a look, and the BBC were very, very kind to let us read it aloud to you. The first BBC broadcast, a memoir by Arthur R. Burroughs, Written, it would seem, mid-November 1942. But a few elements of it do contradict things that we sort of know from the newspaper articles for the day, for example. Especially whether or not there was music on day one, or was it just a news bulletin. So I needed a couple of experts who have done their bit. So newspaper detective Andrew Barker and the great collector of Radio Timeses and all sorts of knowledge about the early days of the Beeb, Dr Steve Arnold. So I'm going to bring you the full works this episode of what Arthur Burroughs wrote, but we'll interject now and then with the thoughts of our very own Brains Trust. To begin with, though, the words and occasionally the voice of Arthur Burroughs. A pea soup fog was hanging thickly over London 20 years ago last evening. Sensible people were in their homes, sitting comfortably before their fires. But in two rooms on the top floor of Marconi House in the Strand, unusual things were happening. In one of these, which had been partitioned from a wide passage, a coatless figure, closely absorbed in his strange duties, was passing slowly up and down before two rows of luminous globes as big as rugby footballs. These were the valves, or the Aladdin's lamps, which formed the heart of a broadcasting transmitter. These lamps were being warmed up to their task of throwing wireless waves over Greater London and beyond. In a few minutes, the BBC was to take the air officially for the first time. Nearby, in a room which had been a private cinema, but was now draped in plain canvas, was a small orchestra. Hanging before the players were a number of telephone mouthpieces. Two similar microphones were hidden in the piano. In another part of this queerly equipped room was a solitary figure standing before a reading desk. Alongside him was a set of tubular bells. Both he and the conductor of the orchestra were watching alternately the second hand of a chronometer on the wall and a red lamp above the entrance door. Suddenly, the red lamp glowed. A few seconds later, the second hand reached zero, and a peal of Westminster chimes was struck upon the bells. Maybe, Andrew, uh, I'll begin with you, because you've done loads of research into the newspaper. What's the, the received wisdom about how the first day of the BBC uh, went? Well, the first day was simply two news broadcasts. We have some difference in, as to what the first words were said on, on the BBC. We have the, the two books, one by... Brian Hennessy, and a recent one by David Hendy, and they both have different versions of the of the first words spoken. Um, but I think we can be pretty sure that those refer to the 14th of November, 1922. As the sound died away, the speaker advanced his microphone and announced, To Marconi House, London, calling. 
This is Tuello, the London station of the BBC, calling the British Isles. Burroughs talks about the opening statement that launches the BBC, and that's different from the ones published in by David Hendy's book and also Brian Hennessy's book. So that, that doesn't make sense for the 14th mm. either. It may have been a statement he made on the on the 15th or the 16th instead, when he announces it as this is the BBC, as opposed to the what we think is the announcement, one of the announcements, saying we're broadcasting on behalf of the British Broadcasting Commission. And one little red flag, I suppose, on that, one little red lamp over that line, is the word BBC. It isn't generally speaking, it's a little later that we think that the... It's initialised as BBC? It's not It's not used till really March, apart from a single instance of the Gloucester Citizen article where it specifically uses the initials BBC. But um, but generally, the, the, the abbreviation BBC isn't used till about March 1923. Down came the conductor's baton and the little orchestra broke into a lively inaugural march. So I'm pretty sure that um, the 14th of November, there was no music whatsoever apart from the, uh, the tubular bell chimes announcing the the hour at six o'clock when the broadcast began so you've got day one london 2lo this, this is as far as we we know london 2lo on alone on the 14th november the 15th then you get birmingham and manchester uh piping up and literally piping up with with music isn't that right steve you've i know you've looked into this quite carefully at the written archive center that birmingham manchester did have music while london seems to have just done news yeah birmingham obviously there is a a notebook from the station controller so that details what they've got. Um, there's extensive PSB information for Manchester. So you can go through that and see what they broadcast. Frustratingly, it looks as though a page has been torn out of the PSB ledger for Manchester because there's just some remnants at the top um, of the binding. So I can't be sure whether Manchester actually started the day after London or whether it started the same day as London. Newspaper reports do suggest that Manchester started the same day as London, but Marconi were the ones in control. They were the major shareholders. They ran most of the stations. They wrote the history. I don't believe everything that's written. I just want things confirmed before I will believe them. Stanton Jeffries was the conductor. In his orchestra were veterans of the English musical world, but it is doubtful whether in all their experience at the Royal Albert or Queen's Halls they had taken part in so strange or exacting a performance as they gave that evening. They were on the air for the first time to an invisible audience spread over hundreds of square miles. Some of their listeners perhaps were struggling for a share of the family headphones. Amongst others were wireless operators on ships at sea. It's interesting with the the, the music that is purported by Arthur Burroughs because the Gloucester Citizen on Wednesday the 15th of November so this is the day after broadcasting started, it says, Broadcasting at last. Although we've had to wait long for it, broadcasting has come at a fortunate moment, says the Times. It was played in last night by concerts, and tonight and tomorrow, owners of receiving sets will get election results comfortably by their firesides. So this is a newspaper report of the time saying that there was concerts, but it's referencing the Times. And I can't find any mention in the Times that suggests that there were concerts. So the Gloucester Citizen is a lone voice in this respect. But it does say there was music. I suspect that that term played in, and the the term played in is in quotes. It may refer to test transmissions or even broadcasts made by 2LO in the preceding days where there definitely was music before the BBC broadcasts officially began. It's just the way it's written. It was played in, in quotes, last night by concerts. Now, it's not suggesting, oh, right, there was a run up to this and everything else. This one is, as I say, it's a lone voice. Only one that says there was music. Doesn't that also sound a bit like, though, one of those sort of press releases that sort of says... This is that the was, thing that will happen. It doesn't sound like a report. This was what I was going to say. Back then, it was a slower time. We're used to news being reported before it happens. Um, and I know that sounds a bit weird, but you, you get stuff on the Today programme or breakfast television. And later today, 
we expect this to be said in this conference or this speech to be made. Back then, it was a lot slower. Communications were a lot slower. So I do believe it's what you say. Um, It was probably pre-prepared. There were press releases. Why the Gloucester Citizen is different to any others is a curious fact. It may just be that we haven't got digitised copies of other newspapers that do carry the same information. To myself, fell the honour of making the opening announcement. For some months previously, I had been engaged in preparing for a London broadcasting service by organising experimental broadcasts, searching for sites suitable for a broadcasting headquarters, and seeking facilities for what are now termed outside broadcasts. Those first few moments were anxious ones. The engineer's signal OK released feeling which must be akin to those experienced by a prisoner at his moment of reprieve. Confident though I was of the future of broadcasting, I confess that at that time I had no idea it would reach its present popularity. Andrew, you've you've read pretty much every newspaper we can... I mean, I know you both have, actually. uh, But, Andrew, you've been collating (laughs) particularly... uh, You're doing on our lovely Facebook group, the On This Day, uh, in uh, in the newspapers, what they reported about the BBC at the time. To summarise, there's nothing about music, is there, anywhere, apart from Arthur Burroughs' memory? No, there uh, there isn't, and there are two newspapers that did cover the, the, that first items, first days broadcast, and tell us what was on the news. And in both those instances, there's the uh, Daily News, the London Daily News, which talked about the news bulletins, uh, and only spoke about the news bulletins and and said what the content was. And there was also the Portsmouth Evening News, which again just spoke about the um, about the news bulletins and their news bulletin contents. No mention of music on that night. And the North Star in Darlington on Wednesday the 15th is pretty much the same. As a start, two copyright news services and official weather reports were issued at 6pm and 9pm on a wavelength of 360 metres. The next sentence is interesting. For the present, it is not intended to broadcast concerts on weekdays. So even if there were concerts planned, they were going to be broadcast on a weekend. That sort of because the start was on a weekday i i think it supports the fact that there was no no but, music and, I, uh, and yet birmingham manchester we have the the listings there of when there were like what 15 or so songs on each of them on on the 15th it would seem the station directors note thankfully birmingham manchester seemed to keep pretty good logs and you've got yeah percy Edgar writing down literally you name the 15 songs um but i mean what i i'm going to be the devil's advocate sort of i i I, agree, I mean i agree with you the newspapers uh are massive evidence against arthur burrow's memory of music being on day one of the bbc but i find it odd that all summer long from june i think it is onwards london to Hello were doing concerts a couple of times a week and there's listings of which performers were performing which songs and then it just stops you know he's been demonstrating at the wireless exhibition and you could hear uh, you could hear Rex Palmer before he was an announcer doing some songs and things in late September, early October. But then the BBC launches with a whimper, it would seem. In you know, and that, but news. that's that's the thing. It's the BBC launches. Yeah. This is the start of official broadcasting. Everything that went before was unofficial experimental test broadcasting. The first BBC programme was not mainly musical. The feature of this particular evening was the broadcasting of election results, for the nation had been to the polls that day, and arrangements had been made with the news agencies for the broadcasting of the figures as they arrived. But on the 15th of November, we have a report on the election night from Amateur Wireless magazine, which was published on 25th of November. And on this report, again, there is nothing that indicates there was there was music. And I'll just read a little of this. It's a fairly short report. Mm. Um, election night was really most exciting. When the first result came in at about 10 o'clock, little a crowd hanging. It, if one may put it so, on the lips of my loudspeaker, thought it was thought that the rest would shortly be arriving thick and fast. Closing down for five minutes, said the voice. Feverishly, the minutes were ticked off. Then, with ten good seconds to go, the switches were put over. No more news. Closing down for another five minutes. We agreed that result couldn't, after all, be expected before half past ten. Later, we made it half past eleven. And later still, we fixed half past twelve as the likely zero hour for the great rush. 
It never came. Results, quite a number of them, trickled in. But the man with the pencil was never really net, uh, overworked. The man with the pencil will be somebody probably in his uh, listening in, in, in that receiver. Mm. I've heard a great many long before lesser men relying on the landline could possibly do so. And the half-hourly resumes of the state of the parties provided both the optimist and the pessimist present with all the material that they needed to prove that their fondest hopes or worst fears were in process of realisation. What an evening it must have been for Tuello's announcer. News at six, more news at nine, and election results from then till one in the morning. No no, um, no indication that there was any music that night on the 15th. Now, the announcing of these results should not have caused me any embarrassment, for I had taken part in a number of experimental broadcasts. But on this night in November 1922, we had not reckoned with the fog. The studio at Marconi House was very small. We dared not run the ventilating fan, as its noise would have gone over as a background of escaping steam, so we arranged to open the windows during the interval. In those days, we were required by an official ruling to stop broadcasting for three minutes in each ten, and to listen with headphones to ensure that our transmissions were not proving a nuisance to their wireless services. So each seven minutes, 2LO announced that it was closing down, and then we opened the windows. Each time we did this, for we were gasping for air, in flowed the reddish-brown penetrating fog. In this ever-changing atmosphere of fug and fog, our little orchestra struggled manfully on with its programme. I've got Arthur Burroughs' book, The Story of Broadcasting, 1924. His, all he has is a, is a half a paragraph on it. November 14th, 1922, was the day chosen to commence British broadcasting in the official sense. It was the day of the declaration of polls in connection with the general election. And the news for that evening consisted in the main of election results. So already his memory's a little muddled there, clearly, because it was we, we know that the election thankfully that's a fairly fixed thing. You know, history books say November the fifteenth, nineteen twenty two was the election. So let alone twenty years later in this reminiscence. It, it's interesting because in the book he does mention about the Aladdin's lamps and things like that. So that reflects the later memories, but the music is a, is not present in the book and like you say there's bits that don't quite fit and uh, that's something that i've noticed throughout most of the reminiscences of people that were there at the time the the general gist of it is right but the actual detail can be moved around to suit what they remember it being and other events have happened i i suspect burrow's had probably conflated two different events. I agree with you about conflating events and memory, and it's much easier now we've got Wikipedia and things like that to look these things up. But there's this one bit in that reminiscence from Burroughs that I can't see how you can conflate this. He must have fabricated this because he says about the election night, he says, Complaints of the huskiness of the announcer would have been justified. It was a bit cruel on the orchestra, however, to receive criticisms that some of its selections which followed groups of election results showed undue political bias. Those players, I assure you, were more concerned with the state of their lungs than the state of the poll. Under such conditions, the BBC made its formal bow in London. Listeners were criticising some musical selections that followed certain election results because it showed, in quotes, undue political bias. So, which is a lovely idea, the fact that I suppose a jaunty musical piece after a, a certain party political win could be seen as celebrating it, whereas a, a, a mournful one after the Liberal win or something might be seen as, as criticising it. And I love that idea that bias is coming in, accusations are coming in that early. But that, that's not, that can't be a conflation then, can it? The thing you need to remember is that the election results were broadcast on both the 15th and the 16th of November. Oh, OK. And there was music on the 16th. So I think it's highly likely that Burroughs is actually talking about the broadcast on the 16th when we believe there was music. And that may be that the recollection there. Broadcasting has, for me, lost none of its romance. I have known strange happenings during 20-odd years in its service at home and abroad. The first of these came as a sequel to our efforts on that foggy night in November 1922. It was a letter from a ship's operator stating that he had received the election results on a crystal set whilst his boat was steaming through the Mediterranean. 
We had calculated that the crystal range of our first transmitter would be of the nature of fifteen to twenty miles. Hmm. Signed, A. R. Burroughs. Are we generally then of the belief that day one, November the 14th, London broadcasts news. Day two, November the 15th, Birmingham and Manchester give their little the musical pieces, which I think Chrysler's Lieber's Lead is the first recorded music played in um, Manchester, the first live music then from Il Trovatore in Birmingham. That's all the 15th and then election results that day as well. And then in November the 16th, you get more election results, London concert. And then from then on, it sort of levels out, I suppose, to a degree of news and music. And, and Arthur Burroughs is muddling it all together. I, I think so. Um, one thing that is mentioned in Amateur Wireless of 9th of December is that the Tuello Orchestra made its first performance on November 25th. But of course, it may well have had a, a, a scratch orchestra on that day, the, the 16th, which performed. I, I think Burroughs, being there at the time, he had a lot to do. Um, I I do think things have got muddled. His is one of the earliest reports of what went on in those early days. The, the, the book was a year later. I think by 42, things have just got a little muddled. When you know you you start getting asked can you tell me what went on like so in 32 the radio times covered the 10th anniversary and they will talk to people and it's who they choose so they may not choose everybody or those that were particularly important and you start getting a myth growing there where you get sound bites someone reads it and thinks oh is is that what happened oh yeah and it sways their memories and what's printed becomes part of their memory bank and then they repeat it. it it's it's interesting to actually look at that when you're researching to see if you can go back further and try and get to the, the first nugget because that's probably the, the nearest to the truth. What? 42 is way down the line. Mm. You know, it's 20 years later. There's bits in it that are definitely stuff that he's used before this bit about music hasn't appeared and it would have if um it had happened well that's what baffled me i've not read it in any book anywhere and um i don't know when it's been last consulted at the written archive center or anything like that but it's a lovely uh, descriptive tale it's a myth isn't it it's an origin it's a creation myth that's what we really have of the bbc here i suppose if only these people were still alive and instead of you sort of interviewing us on the podcast <laughs> it's the best you we could have. interview them You're the best um, we have. because i i it would probably settle a huge number of discrepancies and but we've we've missed that boat and if they'd recorded stuff earlier if they just black the phones come along 10 years earlier that would be marvelous but hey ho and on we go So while we're zooming in on the opening of Marconi House, of course, in our timeline, we're at the closing of Marconi House. April the 30th, 1923, the BBC left Marconi House to the Marconi Company and toddled down the road to Savoy Hill, the first permanent home of the BBC. But while we're talking about the BBC leaving premises, let's go bang up to date and think about the BBC leaving Wogan House. As I record this, Paul Gambaccini has just done a stirring and marvellous tribute to both Wogan House and indeed the sad death of Steve Wright. If you've not heard Gambaccini's closing remarks from Wogan House, they are well worth seeking out. We've shared them on our Facebook group and on Twitter. Find us there, British Broadcasting Century. Now, I've worked on and off at Wogan House over the last 10 years, mostly off, uh, largely doing pause for thought on the Radio 2 breakfast show, but also some other bits and pieces here and there that have snuck along their way. So what are my favourite memories of Wogan House? Well, let's consider some of the main presenters that I've worked under and some of the great memories of of those. My way in there was Chris Evans doing the Radio 2 breakfast show. I never met the Wogan of Wogan House, alas. I know some of our listeners have. And what an incredible broadcasting legend he, of course, was. But yes, Evans was at the helm of the Radio 2 breakfast show when I joined. I went in rather nervous, equally nervous if I'm honest, of the studio and the imposing Radio 2 audience but also Evans himself is a live wire isn't he? I found doing pause for thoughts with Chris Evans you never could relax because he might interrupt you at any moment and interrogate you on a certain point but he certainly got the best out of you and got you thinking then of course the very busy Friday studio days when well, well one show I believe it was Mary Berry Russell Crowe 
Simon Le Bon, I recall being there that day as well. But I think the musical guest was uh, Jackie Abbott and Paul Heaton of Beautiful South. Jackie Abbott was such a wonderful down-to-earth, famous person to bump into. I shared a lift with her and uh, she was going, was that all right, that performance? I was like, it's incredible, what are you talking about? I think perhaps my favourite celeb that I met there, without doing the clang of names, was Brian Cranston of Breaking Bad. Uh, just generous, marvellous, gave time to people, absolutely wonderful. I did pause for thought as well under Sarah Cox when she was standing in on The Breakfast Show and was there for her last day doing that before she moved to Afternoons. I was there for the first day of Zoe Ball's Breakfast Show and that was an incredible day to be part of. Lots of nerves, lots of hugs, and she's just such a wonderful individual. Uh, Dermot O'Leary, I did a bit on his Saturday breakfast show. That was great fun. Dermot was just lovely and just as you hope he'd be. Uh, seeing Ken Bruce at the ever-broken coffee machine there on the top floor of Wogan House, that was always marvellous too. Hearing the phones ring for Popmaster. By the end of it, I knew the answers to the questions, I think. I recorded a Christmas meditation for Radio 4, just a, a festive poem from the studio there on the sixth floor of Wogan House. And that was marvellous to be sitting in that chair where they do the breakfast show and Jeremy Vine does his show. But surely a highlight for me has to be working with Steve Wright, only very briefly. But I somehow managed to get on as a guest on his big show, Steve Wright in the afternoon. And to go into that studio and see Steve and Tim and his machine of plenty where he pushes that button and they applaud as they do on the radio. I was ready to turn around and see the posse, see some hidden audience. But of course, with Steve, it's all about the sound effects and uh, singing over those songs, but just ever so welcoming. And Steve Wright, well, you've heard a thousand tributes already about him. And indeed, if you want to see more, I've put a little video on our Facebook group and on Twitter and things like that. And I was honoured to be invited in to Radio 2 Breakfast Show to do a pause for thought about Steve, uh, reflecting on him when the news was just announced. That was my first time in the new Radio 2 studio, one I'll never forget as they were all hit hard by that news. Loved the show, Steve, and thank you so much for having me on as a guest. But particularly, thank you for having me as a listener. Let's go back to 1923, shall we? We've talked enough about the BBC's first day at Marconi House, the 14th of November 1922. But what about its last day then? 30th of April 1923. Well, seemingly in the listings, no fuss was made. The schedules for that day show and there was a news bulletin. Cecil Lewis gave a talk to women, really a trailer for Women's Hour, which was to start two days later. See two episodes time for more on that with Dr. Kate Murphy as our guest. A live outside broadcast from Kingsway Hall, just up the road, a few yards away. It looks then like the last Marconi House performance was from a Mr. S.A. Golden, Hawaiian guitar artist, playing On the Beach at Waikiki. Hawaiian guitar was very popular on the early beep, especially in Newcastle. The crisp sound was easier to come through the crackling airwaves than maybe some other instruments. The sound of a piano, for example, was rather dull through the ether. We know that Marconi House was cramped. It was effectively just a, a very small suite of rooms. The BBC was rapidly expanding and we're obviously very keen to get away into, into a bigger space. It's a lovely description. I've got this from... Um... Uh, Brian Hennessy's book, The Emergence of Broadcasting in Britain. And he's got a lovely detail of it. He says, Tuolo was situated at the top floor of Marconi House in the Strand. Its windows built into the upper part of the mansard roof. The building by famous architect Norman Shaw remains um, externally much as it was, but alas, not the mansard roof, which I think, which I think the roof is now called the, the radio bar or something like that. So they have a, a, a tribute to it if the... The roof, alas, is no longer what it was. The roof was sacrificed when, in 1957, the adjoining Gaiety Theatre was redeveloped for offices in a scheme combining the two sites. Marconi House was originally built as a restaurant for Edwardian Bon Viveurs, with a wine bar, a Masonic temple and apartments. But the restaurant was a failure. In 1912, the whole building was substantially adapted to provide a head office for Marconi. And then, yeah, you've got this small cinema then on the top floor where they used to give little training videos for the Marconi engineers and that's what Arthur Burroughs sort of occupied for essentially ju just under a year is all it was as a radio studio really but often in those early days he was having to kick out the engineers wanting to watch their training films so he could do his broadcast concerts so it's it's played its role and the BBC moves onward and upward <laughs> Thanks for listening. Do join us next time when we will launch Savoy Hill by recreating its momentous first launch night when they really did make a song and dance about it on the air and there was secret alcohol hidden around Savoy Hill. More on that next time and you'll hear some of the speeches that made it to air. Do join us on patreon.com slash if you'd like to support the podcast and get some behind the scenesy things as well.
And indeed, if you'd like to hear the Arthur Burroughs memoir in full without interruption, I posted it on Patreon, but for free for all to listen to. So follow the link in the show notes and you can hear that intact without our interruptions clarifying and correcting. But my thanks to Andrew Barker and Dr. Steve Arnold for doing so this time and trying to put history right. Do rate and review us if you can, if you'd like to. It all helps us get out there. This is just a one-man band run by me, Paul Carenza, so we thank you for it. To conclude then, shall we hear some of those sounds that you would have heard from the Marconi House days of London to a low on the BBC? The first five months of official British broadcasting. To a low, Marconi House, London, calling. To a low, Marconi House, London. And we also have with us... The first singer whose name appears in such records as exist of our early programme. So here's an impression of what it sounded like to listeners at that time. It was a great adventure to broadcast, of course. I remember one man coming up to tell me, one night, we call them studio managers nowadays, I think they were balance and control or something in those days, came up and whispered in my ear while I was playing, it's coming over very nicely. I was nearly put off, I nearly stopped at this point. calling, two L.O. calling. That was Drake Goes West, sung by Mr. Leonard Hawke, baritone. Uh, one moment, please, while we move the piano. Hello, everybody. A comedy fragment from life, a Cockney sketch, entitled Our Lizzie Listens In. Allow me, Dax. You know, I wasn't struck on listening in first go off. As I says to my old man, if anyone wants to sing to me, I like to see who's doing it. Fancy getting sloppy over a fella singing, Come, give me love. And then finding he's about 80 with a red nose. <laughs> with a pair of goggles on the ears. And just then I heard someone say, Tuello calling. This is Tuello. The London station of the British Broadcasting Company. So I says two hellos to you, too. Mr. Green says, who are you talking to? I says, I don't know, but he sounds matey. And just then I heard a band play. Oh, wasn't tough. Nice. Well, that is over. So if you ever want to listen in, ducks, come round to Lizzie's house and have a real good time. This is two hello calling. Reverend John Mayo, Rector of Whitechapel, is going to give you a short address. It is my privilege, by the aid of the wizardry of Mr. Marconi in this wonderful house, to speak, as I understand, to many thousands of people. To be the last in the year 1922 to speak to you is a responsibility before which the most confident might quake. In my own socks, if I knew the route. For now, when I put on a shoe or a boot, where there ought to be hosiery, there's nought but a foot. So I wonder what made her go. So if ever the whole of the railways go bust, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. It wouldn't, really. There was an elderly lady who I regret to say got very intoxicated one night. Father, stop your whiskers, ever rubbing, let's go dine. This is London calling. Here is the chief engineer who's going to give you one of his technical talks. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to talk tonight about fading. Fading is probably one of the most important things that one's got to consider in this whole art of work. The night shall be filled with music, and the cares that infest the day shall fall. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. The memoir was written by Arthur Burroughs and brought to you with kind permission from the BBC, thanks to the BBC Written Archive Centre, and we acknowledge the Burroughs family as well, who I'm still trying to trace via LinkedIn and the like. If you're part of the Burroughs clan, please do get in touch. We would love to hear from you. 
We don't think that copyright is owned by the BBC on this occasion, because it's not clear this was for a BBC publication or broadcast. But if that memoir is owned by the BBC, then BBC copyright content is, of course, reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation, all rights reserved. We thank them for it, and we thank Arthur Burroughs for not only writing that reminiscence, but bringing us that first BBC broadcast to begin with. Stay subscribed and find us on Twitter, or X, whatever they call it nowadays, and on Facebook, or Facebook, as they call it nowadays. And join us next time for the launch of Savoy Hill here on the British Broadcasting Century.